you got to take your shirt off. I can't be taking all the heat in the comments. And <laughs> What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, which is BDGE's weekly dynasty show hosted by Michael down there. Mr. FB God over there uh, looking beautiful with this little hairstyle he's got going on. Right, I, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Mike uh, thankfully has his shirt on this time around so uh, I know you guys will actually be able to pay attention to the big facts and not <laughs> mesmerized by them little titties down there <laughs> today's episode is going to be our all fade list for rookies this is a dynasty show but since it's August since it's clickbait season we need to focus a little bit on the redraft stuff you know rookies are a big part of redraft year in and year out especially the running backs some of the wide receivers so we want to cover what guys that you know, there's some guys that we love in Dynasty, but we're going to be fading in redraft, and that's what we are going to be talking about today. If you missed last week's episode, we talked about the must-own rookies. Them two were on it. I was not on that one, but they talked about the rookies that they will be targeting in redraft, so go back and check that out. Make sure you do so on their YouTube channel and on their podcast. And before we get into it, if you want the entirety, the list of our entire all-fade list, everything, everything's in the guide, the Big Dog's Guide is live the rookie the dynasty the season long the all fade list the must own list the rankings everything is in there the easiest way to get that monkeyknifefight.com use the promo code bdge when you deposit 10 bucks and play a game on there you will get all of said things for free when you deposit the ten dollars on there i'm going to give away two draft guys this episode what you got to do is follow michael follow fb god on twitter and leave them a podcast review. Bunk Bed Breakdowns podcast in the iTunes store. You leave a review, you send one of us a screenshot or some shit, and we will pick two draft guide winner giveaways for next week. <sighs> I'm going to pass away. Someone take the mic. It's, uh, it's exciting uh, to host with uh, Rafael Nadal and Nick. All right, let's hit that intro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys, boys. Last episode was fun. Uh, didn't put on a shirt. Decided to tuck my shirt in today. But we're still going to be dropping them big-ass facts. We're going to kick it off with my 101, the 102 for Nick and Noah, Jonathan Taylor. Uh, you know, we're all about this dude in Dynasty, but he's currently going at pick 46th overall at, in the beginning of the fourth round at RB19. And... You know, I don't know about you guys, but I think at this price, even as a Jonathan Taylor truther through and through, it's it's just too steep because what you're passing up to get someone like Jonathan Taylor there is DJ Moore, Allen Robinson, Odell Beckham, Juju Smith-Schuster, all guys that have top five legitimate upside. And if you constructed your roster right, which means you did not go zero RB because it's fucking dumb. Um Actually, I guess, I mean, someone put out a tweet that said we're all going to be zero RB because nobody's going to be drafting this year because no season. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, if you drafted right and you took a couple running backs in the early rounds, you are going to need to get wide receivers. And this is the money zone, money shot, Rachel Star level money shot content. Okay. Allen Robinson is not something you can pass up. And as much as I love Jalen Jonathan Taylor, I just can't pull the trigger there. The dudes, the dudes that we know that are rookies that come into the year and we know they're going to be in a committee, like even the guys you like, Jonathan Taylor, last year was Miles Sanders and David Montgomery. Like you could love them as a prospect, but you know they're going to be in a committee. You can't be taking those guys in the third or fourth round. You know what you're getting yourself into. Like it's not worth a third round investment or a fourth round investment because you're going to need to play your third and fourth round players in the starting spots and in the flex positions. And you're not going to be able to count on a lot of these players early on in the year. So we might see a Jonathan Taylor like esque Miles Sanders season, right? Back half of the back half of the year and him blow up and help you win a league or whatever. But Miles Sanders was also like a sixth, seventh, eighth round pick last year. Mm -hmm. So you weren't depending on him to produce in your lineup. So way too early for Jonathan Taylor for me. Everything out of Indy's camp has just been running back by committee. We're sharing the load, we're sharing the load, we're sharing the load. No one's arguing whether or not Taylor's better than Mac. That's not the argument here. There's no argument to be made from Mac's side. But, like, the valuable touches through the passing game, we don't know if they're going to go to Taylor. It's just – it's not a good redraft situation for Jonathan Taylor. And the price capital based on his talent is just it, – it doesn't add up. It, it should not be a thing right now. 
Yeah, and alongside those wide receivers that Mike named, which I all would I would prefer all of them to Jonathan Taylor. Looking at the running backs in that range, like Melvin Gordon is in that range. He has a much safer floor, and I think he has just as high, if not higher, of a ceiling behind that Denver offensive line, probably getting the goal line and passing down work. Just like Nick said, like we don't know exactly what his role is. Maybe he's the goal line back. Maybe he's not. He's not going to be the pass down back. Him and Marlon Mack are probably going to split touches between the 20s as well. So he's somebody I'm a little bit worried about. Even later, Chris Carson going a half a round later, even though he might not be the healthiest guy out there, if he's on the field, we know what he is. He's a top 10 to 12 running back who sees 20 to 25 touches in a game with very like very little competition despite what Yannick thinks about Carlos Hyde and his Ohio State days. Uh, he's basically in the dirt at this point. And, and Chris Carson, we've seen what he is in the NFL. And another guy we talked about last week, J.K. Dobbins. He's RB30 going a few rounds after. Like, we know both of these guys, Taylor and Dobbins, aren't going to be passing down specialists. But we also think with J.K. Dobbins' situation, the fact that Mark Ingram is a little bit older and the talent that he has, he might be in line for a second-half breakout like we saw with Miles Sanders, which is also the case for Jonathan Taylor. But the thing is, you're getting, you're getting him at a two-round discount in comparison to Taylor's price. So give me J.K. Dobbins two rounds later any day of the week. And just like Mike said, I'll take a DJ Moore, Allen Robinson over Jonathan Taylor because they're so safe and they're just going to be in your lineup week in and week out and you know what you'll get up. Yeah, fantasy, fantasy is easy this year. Two running backs early, two or three wide receivers in a row. Grab DeAndre Swift in round six. Grab J.K. Dobbins in round eight and you're going to be fucking set to go for the year because one of those two is going to pop off. Taylor's price is just, is just too early for, yeah. for anyone that's sane. Yeah, I mean, that, that's like the exact reason why. Like we talked about last week, like J.K. Dobbins could be that league winner for you. It's a low probability, but like if he hits, like he could be that low uh, league winner for you. And he's the reason why, like you can't go Jonathan Taylor here. And honestly, like for me, like that round three to round five is like the RB dead zone for me. I don't, I rarely, rarely take RBs there just because, especially like now, like when you have like so much good wide receiver value there. So like even like Melvin Gordon, I think it's a little bit risky, but definitely a better case. And like you said, Chris Carson going later, a uh, guy who has question marks, but a lot more volume. But yeah, generally speaking, I'm taking RB early. I'm fading RB in the middle, in the middle part. And then I'm, once we get to like that, that like late fifth, sixth, seventh round, when you're starting to think about drafting like flex plays and backups, that's when I'm looking for guys like J.K. Dobbins, you know, DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, and, and what have you. And J.K. Dobbins happens to be the cheapest one. So that's one I'm going to uh, pretty much every single draft. Yeah, and another rookie running back that we will be fading that uh, has pretty much been fading out of the picture in itself because just like with the Marlon Mack reports about how he's going to handle some work there, Ronald Jones has not stopped getting headlines down in Tampa Bay. I think it's real, man. I really do. I'm glad I kind of bought in like a month or so ago, and I think the headlines are real there. They keep saying it over and over again that Ronald Jones is the guy. Everybody else is competing. This summer couldn't have gone worse for Keyshawn Vaughn just in terms of like situating himself into the NFL. You know, fun prospect, a uh, really good way to just a speed score, which I think is like the thing that most people are kind of like hanging on to right now. Third round draft capital is not something to go crazy about. That's not like replacement level draft capital. You know, like, yes, you take a third round running back because you might need depth or you might think this guy has some upside. But third round is not typically where you're like, okay, this is going to be our starter rolling forward. Keyshawn Vaughn doesn't have the summer to practice with Tom Brady. Uh, Darian Gumbawale, pass catcher there. Ronald Jones, a lot of early down work. Keyshawn Vaughn just is a really, really easy fade and redraft, in my opinion. Yeah, the reason why I'm not on the Keyshawn Vaughn train, at least for this year, I do like him a little bit more in Dynasty than redraft, is you kind of touched on it. Like, so much is going wrong for him. He got put on the COVID list, which means in an already shortened offseason, in a brand new offense, obviously, because he's a rookie, um, new quarterback in that system, he's not going to be able to practice with them. We've seen Ronald Jones get the hype, and Dare, I'm not going to even try to pronounce his last name, or whatever the Gumbo fuck it is. Mike, no, no chance. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just did that. That was the first time I ever um, got it correct. Like, I don't know where that came from. I think I like blacked out when I said it. Uh, Dari Gumbawale, so just like, <laughs> and it came out, and like no one made a face and no one corrected me, and I was like, oh shit, I got that right. <laughs> While you're hot, Nick, say Albert O's last name. Al, I don't even. What's the second letter? Of it? I don't even know. K. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Albert Abungawale. Uh, Yep. <laughs> they're brothers <laughs> they're brothers <laughs> <laughs> but along with him being on the COVID list we've also seen what Bruce Aarons has done in the past with younger running backs Ronald Jones last year played 40 percent of snaps in back-to-back -back weeks just three times and it took until week 15 for 17 for him to hit that mark three weeks in a row despite Peyton Barber being terrible and if we remember back to David Johnson's rookie year in Arizona he, it took him until week 13 to see more than 10 touches in a single game 
even though up until that point on 54 touches, he scored seven touchdowns, including, or not including, but he also had an additional kick return touchdown. So it's not really a question of talent. I think it's just more the situation that he's in. The coach that he's playing with doesn't like to give rookies a big role off the jump. If you're picking him at RB36, you want a guy who is going to give you upside. You're not choosing an RB3 so you can put an RB3 in your lineup every week because that's like four points a game. I just don't think he has the upside that many people may think. I'm not sure he's going to be the passing down guy just because he was good at catching passes in college. Ronald Jones did decently with the ball in his hands through the air last year. Ronald Jones is probably a better runner at this point of his career, and he just has more longevity in that offense. So at RB36, it's not like it's an extremely high price to pay, but you see Zach Moss going one and a half rounds later, who has a cemented role, is probably going to handle some passing down work in the goal line, which can't be said for Keyshawn Vaughn, or even Alexander Madison at RB40 who's going to have a role whether or not Dalvin Cook is hurt. And Dalvin Cook does not have a good track record of staying healthy. And if he goes down, we know Madison is the top 10 to 12 running back for fantasy if that happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with you guys. Uh, I'm actually just fading Keyshawn Vaughn altogether. Dynasty, redraft, doesn't matter. Um, I just think, you know, the hype got a little bit out of control. And like Keyshawn Vaughn truthers, like the only thing they had to hang on to was like Ronald Jones couldn't catch passes and Ronald Jones couldn't pass pro which I think is like a super overrated thing. Anyways, like, look, I'm not a Ronald Jones truther. I'm not going out and buying a bunch of Ronald Jones either. I think that backfield is, is pretty messy. Um, but if I had to pick one, I'd probably probably go with Ro uh, Rojo. And I just think like, yeah, there's just like, it just doesn't make sense to me as one's RB36 when there's like other guys that are more flex starter appeal, like Zach Moss, that are going a full round later. You also have like high upside wide receiver threes like Deontay Johnson, Christian Kirk, uh, who are, probably all starting for you in your wide receiver three or flex spots. So like, there's just no way I'm taking starters over uh, Keyshawn Vaughn in that spot. If he was going like maybe, I don't know, a few rounds later uh, in like that handcuff range, like maybe then it'd be a little bit more interesting, but yeah, just, it's just way too pricey for me here. Yeah. He's, uh, he's dropped almost as much as like anybody, I think over the last couple months, but even now where he's down the draft board, like, it's guys like Darius Slayton that I think I'd probably rather have on my team than him. And there's these high upside tight ends like the Jonu Smiths going after him. Other wide receivers like Henry Ruggs I'd even, you know, put over Keyshawn Vaughn. Because I think, like, best case scenario, like, what even is his upside? There, I don't think there's any chance that anyone in this backfield actually gets a three-down roll. Like, best case scenario, him and Ronald Jones probably split carries. Because right now it's very much in favor of Ronald Jones. And I don't know. I just don't see a, a world where Keyshawn Vaughn makes an impact in uh, redraft leagues this year. Yeah. I could see the whole backfield, honestly, being replaced by yep. 2021. It's also important to note that, like, you know, obviously COVID affects older people uh, a little bit more heavily, and we know Keyshawn Vaughn is a bit of an older prospect. So, yeah, he's 30, right? Look that. Yeah, he's basically 30, which means he's 50. He's almost retired. So, yeah, he's older than that. Bruce Arians. <laughs> the whole thing with COVID, too, like, I don't know why people want their players to get COVID. Like, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. We don't, we have no idea what the long term effects of this shit are. Yeah. Like, what if players go out there and after a full game of the NFL, they're just like, yo, I, I don't feel right. I had dude. COVID. I went out. My heart was fucked up. You know, like that could very much happen too. So, dude, that's the thing. It, but. Did you did you see the the tweet from uh, Vaughn Miller? He basically tweeted like he he had COVID, and these yeah. are like this is like a peak athlete, like like top like top half percentile, top zero point zero one percentile of the world in terms of peak athleticism. And he basically said like he couldn't eat. He lost like fifteen pounds. Lost all his strength. Like when I read that, I was like. If someone gets COVID, like, during the season, that's a lock. That's, it's not just rap. like, yeah, it's not just that's like, oh, he tests negative for it. Now he's back to NFL status. Like, there's probably a lot more to it that we don't know. So, yeah. having it makes it a little bit nerve. He did just get off the COVID IR list, I think, a couple of days ago. But, like, that does not guarantee any sort of health or back to prospect, you know, level athleticism that he came into the league with. So Yep, and speaking about somebody that came into the league with athleticism, we got our least favorite running back of all time, A.J. Dillon. Fuck A.J. Dillon. All my homies <laughs> hate A.J. Dillon. RB55 off the board. All my homies hate A.J. Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to say about him is this guy stinks. Like, I don't understand why anybody would draft him and redraft. You need both Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones to get hurt for him to have any sort of value. Because if Aaron Jones gets hurt, we still know Jamal Williams is going to be on the field and passing down, and passing down snaps. He's probably going to get some of the goal line works, too. So you're going to get a between-the-tackles grinder and A.J. Dillon. I'm not a fan of that. If Jamal Williams gets hurt, Aaron Jones edges him out in every single aspect of the field. So although it's a season where we'll likely see a lot of players in and out of the lineup because of various different types of injuries, like obviously COVID on top of what's, what else is normally happening, happening to running backs, uh, it just there's too much that needs to go wrong 
for something to go right for A.J. Dillon. And he's not somebody that's ever going to catch passes. He's never going to take over the goal line work from Aaron Jones. And I'm pretty sure Aaron Rodgers hates this guy because the whole draft was just set up to piss Aaron Rodgers off. So <laughs> I think him alone is just going to keep him off the field. And if you want to make the argument that draft capital matters and him being a second-round pick means something, keep in mind they took a quarterback in round one, a fat-ass running back in round two, and a fucking fullback in round three. So I really don't care where he was picked. This guy is a fraud. I don't care if he went to D.C. <laughs> and that's my mom's alma mater. This guy's not going to be anything in the league, and I'm not afraid to say it. And also, I've been burnt in the past by big, fat running backs who can run a 4-5. or five. So I, I have a decent track record. Actually, I have a terrible track record. But I, I know enough now to fade a guy like A.J. Dillon going into this year. Yeah, look, to what player is A.J. Dillon most oft compared? Dirk. Uh, we Dirk, we Dirk had, Dirk. like, um, a guy that used to hand out hot dogs Eddie at our Lee. high school football games. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of him a little bit. Yeah, Der- Derrick Henry, okay? If we, if we think about the situation, it's also pretty similar, right? Like, Derrick Henry was a third-round pick, albeit not a second-round pick. Um, but we all know Green Bay's track record with draft picks isn't the brightest. But would you have been happy to own Derrick Henry in his first year? Because they're equally explosive athletes, right? Like, do you want to know how many times Derrick Henry went above 80 yards in his rookie year? How many times? Zero. Zero. Okay. Like, you're looking at a stat line most likely of, like, 100 to 150 carries, like, 500 to 600 yards, and, like, maybe, like, five to six touchdowns. That is not startable at the running back position. And it is not a gamble I want to make. He's going he's gonna to have zero work in the receiving game. And if anything, Aaron Jones now is much better than DeMarco Murray was uh, when, when Derrick Henry was a rookie. So I think there's just like too much, too much in the way. In fact, like that entire backfield is a little bit risky. Even Aaron Jones at his ADP feels a little bit risky. Um, but there's no way in hell I'm drafting a, a A.J. Dillon because like this is not like someone that – that has very much upside if Aaron Jones goes down for the reasons Noah said, but like roster spots are just way too freaking important early on, right? You cannot afford to hold the AJ Dillon on the back part of your bench when you need to be cycling through those waivers, you know, getting that early, early round waiver action. So this is just not someone that, that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to deal with. He's like someone you'll draft and you'll be like, eh, like I can't really he's drop the, him. He's the, first like, guy you're, he's the first guy you're going to end up dropping when, yeah. when you actually have to drop. Yeah. Him. And then you, by that time you would have missed out on the first three weeks of really important waivers. So all he does is damage your roster. Just fade him. Just don't, don't draft. Yeah, your dumbass kept A.J. Dillon on the bench in favor of Terry McLaurin and D.J. Chark. You drop A.J. Dillon for guys like that. You don't draft A.J. Dillon, okay? <laughs> Probably like the least elusive back I've ever actually watched on film. I can't wait. I don't want to – fuck him. I can't wait to see him not be good in the NFL. The problem with A.J. Dillon is he doesn't have a floor or a ceiling. He doesn't have either of those things. There are going to be multiple games. There are going to be multiple games this year where his, his stat line is three carries for like one yard. Like, that's going to happen a couple times. He's not going to catch a lot of passes there in Green Bay. He never did it at Boston College. Literally had 300 carries his freshman year at Boston College with zero receptions. I don't know how that's even fucking mathematically possible, but that's the kind of game he brings onto the field. So, fantasy-wise, there's just there's nothing there to, to, to love about A.J. Dillon, especially not in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking at guys going around him, Mike Williams, the God, Golden Tate, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Right, and I'll take AJ Dillon there on that first. <laughs> All right. We can move on to the next guy. I don't, I don't want to do this. Anymore. <laughs> um, all right, next up, we got another running back. Uh, someone, someone that we, we liked early on, you know, in the pre-draft process. Uh, Darrington Evans, running back for the Tennessee Titans, going at 171 overalls so in the 15th round at RB57. Sounds cheap, but I just, I just can't get myself – to uh to draft him here because i just i just really i just don't see it um i mean i get it he's a handcuff um but will he take all the work if derrick henry goes down will derrick henry go down like the titans i get it they're like a they're like a really run heavy team right but it doesn't mean that if derrick henry goes down they're going to keep running Darrington and evans like they run derrick henry um so i just think that when it comes to evans it just comes down to like who else can i get right who else are you getting in that range you got golden tate right he was probably starting games for you but the Giants uh, in receptions and yards when he was uh, actually playing. You got even Brandon Ayuk probably got a better shot, right? You got Irv Smith, which is one of my top late round tight end targets. Like there's just too many other guys that are start worthy that I just don't really find myself clicking the button on him. I just don't see him being a true handcuff to begin with. Let's put it. Yeah. Let's put it this way because no one's, no one's just drafting Evans for the sake of drafting him. I think the only reason you would even think about it is if you are a Derrick Henry owner, I think handcuffs are pretty important this year, given like the state of what everything is. But I I think handcuffs only make sense when you actually know there's a handcuff. Like you're making the point where like if 
if Der- I think, first of all, whenever you have to analyze a player, like a back end running back, and you're like, if the guy ahead of him gets hurt, that's all of the analysis you need because you don't need to go any further because that's dumb fucking analysis. And if you're depending on a player to get into your starting lineup because you're depending on an injury, then you shouldn't draft that guy straight up. That's the way I look at things now. But if I am drafting like a Kenyon Drake, I want to get Chase Edmonds. If I am drafting Zeke Elliott, I do want to get Tony Pollard, Dalvin Cook, Alexander Madison, because we know if something does happen to those guys, we know what the workload is going to be like for the guys behind them. What happens, we don't even know that because he's, he's 200, 200 pounds, 205 pounds. Like they're not going to use him in the capacity that they use Derrick Henry. That being said though, like he will be probably like a high end RB two if something happens to Henry. So I might go ahead and, uh, and grab Evans if I'm a Henry owner, but like for no other reason would you draft him this year? I, I'm a little bit different than you uh, on, on that point. Like I don't, I never draft handcuffs for my team uh, in redraft, at least in dynasty I do. Uh, but in redraft, like I'm typically going for like upside. Cause like my philosophy is like, I don't really build for safety. Right. Um, so like if, if I, if like my Zeke, if my Zeke pick bus, if my Dalvin cook pick bus, Dalvin cook's a little bit different cause he's a holdout. But if that pick bus, then like, then like I'm probably kind of kind of fucked anyways um but like if I draft like Alexander Madison I don't own Dalvin Cook and Dalvin Cook holds out like that's a huge spike to my team so I'm trying to look for like high variance plays very rarely do I like draft my own handcuffs I'm usually drafting handcuffs for other teams but to your point even in that scenario we don't know if Darrington Evans is that guy so like that's like my hold up with him yeah Yeah, I feel like do you go bitch (laughs) i've I've changed my tune on that i I thought that way for a while too but i think there's no worse feeling than you're starting running back getting hurt and then you're not getting the guy on the waiver i think the one additional bench spot especially for people in leagues this year where you're probably expanding your bench a little bit like i I think the handcuff does make sense because it, it works either way like having someone else's handcuff having your handcuff it's just a good thing to have as long as it makes sense for the roster that you're building um, I get like the whole like upside you want someone else's thing, but like I, I also think that if you have a good team that pr- that protects your playoff spot probably. If you lose, no, I don't I don't draft good teams, so I don't have that problem either. Very true. I don't know <laughs> who I'm talking to over here. That's some animal analysis right there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Noah, you may continue. I'll allow it. <sighs> Man, fuck Darrington Evans. I just said the same thing about AJ Dillon. <laughs> Mike, you also left out Mike Williams when you're listing alternatives to him. I, I caught that. But the, <laughs> as you guys said. People want Darrington Evans to be Derrick Henry if Derrick Henry goes down because we've seen what Derrick Henry is. But Darrington Evans is 50 pounds lighter, probably the same sort of athleticism, and we saw what the Tennessee Titans want to do. They want to run it off the left tackle 35 times a game and throw it 10 times. That's like Mike Vrabel's wet dream. Darrington Evans is not going to be that. Even if Derrick Henry goes down, I, I see him as like a 10 to 15 touch a player per week and we don't know who's behind him I don't even know if Deion Lewis is still in the NFL but what I would expect is what Deion Lewis would kind of get if Derrick Henry were to go down and I just don't think that's a very high upside uh, player to invest in I don't think he's going to catch a ton of passes not because he's not capable of it but because it's not a very pass heavy team and I think they'd rather throw to John Smith or AJ Brown or Corey Davis if that guy has hands anymore but uh, I'm just not I don't know which side I'd land on when it comes to owning handcuffs. I would just much rather have a Golden Tate or a Ryan Fitzpatrick in a super flex league than hoping a beast like Derrick Henry goes down halfway through the season. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, 100%. And, like, do you know who's going after Darrington Evans, who I would much rather have? Anthony McFarlane. He's going, like, a full round after him. And, you know, granted, like, he's not going to be a workhorse either if something goes down, but he might actually have some, like, explosive plays in him even even if he's, like, you know, Connor stays healthy, which we know is a big ass question mark. Um, All right. Next up rookie wide receiver, Henry Ruggs. Um, And this is not really hating Henry Ruggs. As you'll see, I kind of put Jerry Judy on there as well, uh, just based on where they're going. But Henry Ruggs is currently going in the 12th round wide receiver, 46 at pick 143 overall. Personally, again, redraft. I just very, very rarely draft rookie wide receivers. Um, because they're just rarely a value and like you can almost always like pick them off off waivers like AJ Brown was off waivers right like McLaurin was off waivers Marquise Brown was off waivers like all these guys you can usually like what happens is like for one to two weeks they like might not do anything and then people get tired of it and when you need spots and redraft which are really important they end up hitting the waivers and then at that point you'll have like a trend you can see like who's getting the snaps and that's like the point where I start picking up rookie wide receivers. So, you know, instead of getting someone like him, I'd much rather grab like a John Brown, a Sterling Shepard, or if you really, really want to invest in a rookie wide receiver, you can grab like a Rager or Justin Jefferson a little bit later as well. 
Yeah, for me, I think I actually like this price because those guys that you name, like a John Brown or a Jalen, I, I do like Jalen Rager more than him, but more of the safer options like a John Brown or a Sterling Shepard. I feel like 12 rounds in, you kind of already have your starters and a few other guys that you feel safe putting in your flex spot off the bench. And I've been very vocal about not being a huge Henry Ruggs fan, but it's hard to deny the type of upside that he has. He's not just a deep threat. He is good over the middle and then taking a 15-yard slant to the house, which is what Derek Carr can only do is like throw five to 15 <laughs> yards. I just I think he is a very talented player, and I think them drafting him in the first round, although like Darius Hayward Bay under that same regime was like a first-round pick because he ran fast and tights. I do think Henry Ruggs is a better football player than Darius Hayward Bay because he made his way to Alabama and he competed with other really good players. Um, as wide receiver 46 off the board, I personally, I don't know, I don't hate it. I'm looking, I see, I see Duke Johnson, Blake Jarwin, uh, Chase Edmonds, uh, Tyra Taylor, that's, that's intriguing. But like a bunch of guys I, I don't really like around him uh, as opposed to like the upside that a Henry Ruggs can provide for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you, Noah. I actually don't hate Henry Ruggs here. He's actually... He might be like one of the only rookie wide receivers that I'll target in redraft based on their price. Like, I'm not going to take Judy. I'm not going to take CeeDee Lamb if they need to take him in the single-digit rounds. But Henry Ruggs, I feel like he's going in the double-digit rounds. And I do – I do weirdly, oddly, I want a piece of this passing offense in Oakland. I'm probably going to have Derek Carr as my quarterback two or three in a lot of super flex leagues. And uh, I will probably own some Ruggs. I will own – I won't – I won't stack pass catchers there. Absolutely not. But I probably will have a lot of teams where I have Carr and then one of either Waller, Renfro, or Henry Ruggs. So I'm okay with any of those three pass catchers, but I'm definitely not going to be like, oh, I have Waller. Let me also grab fucking Henry Ruggs because, like you said, Derek Carr is not really capable of dishing out multiple fantasy games to all these pass catchers over here. So Henry Ruggs, I do think he's just an explosive playmaker. And when you're looking at those guys at the end of your bench, I don't, I don't think drafting for a floor makes any sense because, okay, a guy has a floor play, that means he'll never hit your lineup. Like, there's no use for him on your bench. The guy has a ceiling. If he hits that ceiling, then he can get into your lineup. I mean, there's a reason he's on the bench because you haven't seen the ceiling yet once you start doing it consistently, which is something I think Ruggs actually does provide around that draft price where not a lot of people do. So I'm kind of in with Ruggs just because his big playmaking explosive ability is something that, like, might kind of shine through in a rookie year where we don't have the, the chemistry buildup between quarterbacks and wide receivers. Yeah, I think if, uh, you know, if Sterling Shepard wasn't there, I could get on board with that. Or if Jalen Rager and uh, Justin Jefferson were going for cheaper, I could probably also get on board with that. But Sterling Shepard being there is just making me making me kind of, you know, totally, totally fade rugs. Because Sterling Shepard averaged like eight targets a game uh, when he was healthy. Are you in a points per concussion league? He's really good in those. Yeah, he's <laughs> really good in those. Um, but like, I mean, hit like 100 yards on a couple of games as well. So he's like, he's got that like weekly wide receiver one upside, but probably like a middling wide receiver two wide receiver three uh points per game finish which is like I can't, pretty good i can't take shepherd bro like every time i hear the name i just like fall asleep a little bit more it's just <laughs> it's just like the most boring pick i get it like he does he does like quietly produce really 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 fucking well whenever he's on the field but i just i don't know can't sell, to find myself pulling the trigger there that's where i like to go with an upside player over uh, a floor player like shep cool uh and then next up jerry judy we kind of mentioned him he's going at 138 overall wide receiver 44 in the 12th round um, again, for me, like similar range as uh, Henry Ruggs, but there's just like in that range, I'm just not going to take uh, someone like Jerry Judy or rookie wide receiver when, when I have uh, some of the better options available. I just, I just honestly, I just don't see Drew Locke supporting uh, two top 24 wide receivers and like a top 10 tight end plus Melvin Gordon, uh, which is like basically what the what the ADP is trying to suggest. So I'm kind of all out on that price, and I'm just going to like take my time and do a little studying on how the snap snap percentage evolves over the first uh, few weeks to see which which young wide receiver I should be looking at in redraft. Yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty spread out target share there. Like they have Noah Fant, they have Cortland Sutton, they just brought in Melvin Gordon. Uh, we both like, or all three of us like KJ Hamler. I just don't see the sort of upside that he can bring to the table that Henry Ruggs does at a very similar price so I think I'd rather have Henry Ruggs than Jerry Judy uh, obviously the guys we named before like a Jalen Rager even like a Justin Jefferson I feel more confident pulling the trigger on than Jerry Judy just because like we haven't really seen especially under Drew Locke him Denver produce like more than one fantasy viable wide receiver since the Demarius Thomas Emmanuel Sanders days and those are those are very very long gone so I'm sorry animal I'm sorry snacks because we kind of just disparaged Giants and Denver uh, I almost said Nuggets Denver Broncos players but it's the truth you're getting the big facts and that's just a guy I'm gonna fade because I just don't see any sort of upside being drafted there in the 12th round 
Beautiful. We're kill- killing two morons with one stone right there. Yeah, I, I just like <laughs> even, even like you say, like we haven't seen Drew Locke support two fantasy wide receivers. Like we barely saw him support one. Like Cortland Sutton's <laughs> numbers sank really like fucking Titanic sinking over there when Drew Locke got onto the field. So it's messy. Like the number of games that Jerry Judy's probably going to go like five for 42 this year is going to be nauseating. But to Mike's point, like most of the rookie wide receivers, it's almost it, it's like literally annually every year we see a rookie wide receivers play 50 percent of the snaps from weeks one to eight and then the coaches are like oh you're pretty good we'll keep you out on the field and then from weeks nine through 17 it's like 70 80 85 percent that's when you start targeting so the best way to do this is to start looking at the snap percentage of course there's going to be outliers where you have the terries who blow up in week one and if you don't get them there you're never going to get them but for the most part these guys are on very limited snaps and those are the things to keep an eye on so I will give uh, lineups.com is a resource that you guys can use, which is completely free. And it shows the snaps for each player by position, by team, by percentage, by raw count total. Um, so a lot of people always ask, like, where do we find snaps and stuff? So lineups.com is a good one for that. Uh, if you want to look for, like, y- or routes run during the game, you'll have to sign up for an actual premium package on PFF to find that one. But we'll be giving you those big facts throughout the season. So don't even fucking worry about buying that shit. Buy our shit. What else Boom. we got? Uh, I mean, we want to talk a little bit about Antonio Gibson. You know, he's currently go. I mean, based on the last month's ADP, he's still pretty reasonable. He's going at 142 right ahead of Henry Ruggs. You can probably throw that number out. Um, I'm expecting him to probably jump up to wherever Geis was. So Geis was going at RB33 overall in the eighth round of Superflex drafts, sixth round of your traditional one QB drafts. That's the minimum price that I think he's going to jump to. I would assume that he probably even goes above that because yeah. – Geis is gone. Um, I mean, all you have is Adrian Peterson. I think um, if he jumps to like the sixth or the fifth round, I'm probably out uh, because Gotta it's, just, be out. it's just too much risk. And I mean, look, we love Antonio Gibson and anyone that loves Antonio Gibson, like we did, like what we said, he was the RB6 before he even went to the combine, right? That was our ranking. Um, so we we're really high on him, but like we also recognize the risk. Like, dude, the guy only has seven, seven touches, right? It's a big, it's a big question mark. It's a question mark, but it's not a, it's not a killer on his ceiling because we've seen what his ceiling is, right? Because when he got those touches, he was one of the best players on the field and that's what he can be. But betting on him to start for you week one, which is basically what you're saying. If you're drafting someone in the fourth or fifth or even sixth round is, is not a smart investment and is definitely not one I will be making in redraft. So if he falls, if he goes there, which is what I expect, I will be fully fading him in redraft. Yeah. I think, I think one of the bigger points to take away here, and this is just like this, the talent optimism that people have in fantasy is usually a huge problem. Like there's only so much, talent that can overcome a Washington football team like best case scenario like even if I think like Gibson getting 12 touches would be amazing for fantasy like that's what we want right if you're drafting him there you're like oh he better get 12 touches or some shit what is 12 touches in Washington's offense like it really might not be that much if if four or five of them are runs up the middle is he really going to do much behind an offensive line that's not going to open up holes for him so the problem is not that there's too much allure without the production and without the seeing him be efficient in the face of volume. But it's also the fact that he's just in a, you know, objectively look at the situation, like what running back, like if, if Zeke is in this Washington offense, like how high do you actually draft him? Yeah. He's going to get the volume, but like, this is a team that's not going to dictate goal line touches. This is a team that's not going to push the fall, the ball downfield much, you know, Um, there's a lot of risk involved just with any player on the, on the team. Like I love Terry, but like, I'm very much aware that there's a coin flip chance that Dwayne Haskins fucking stinks in this team goes down the gutter like really quickly right and that, that's a case of running backs a case of wide receivers tight ends whoever it is so not only like do you need him to overcome whatever running back by committee is going to be there for ap is somehow going to go over 200 touches this year he's going to get 17 carries a game and he'll have games where he's like 25 carries i don't know how it's going to happen but we know it's going to happen and uh and, and there's a lot to overcome for gibson so you could love the talent but like talent is not everything when it comes to fantasy football yeah, I mean, if it was, he'd be a first-round pick because we all believe he's really good. And as you were saying, Nick, like, what are the chances that two positions on this team, separate positions, produce as top 24 options? Like, I think Terry McLaurin can do it, but that doesn't mean I think Antonio Gibson can do it. I just don't think that there's enough firepower in this offense, especially with a completely new offensive system. The fact that Darius Geis was looking to be the workhorse or at least the lead back there, now he's gone. they got to change things up. So there's just a lot of moving parts in that offense. As you said, Adrian Peterson is still there. Rob Kelly is probably still there somehow. They just have so many different options in that backfield that aren't good. And we hope Antonio Gibson gets to step up and show what he's worth because we do believe he is the most talented player in that backfield at this point of his career. But even in Memphis, when he was extremely efficient, they weren't getting him the ball in his hands as much as they probably should have. 
And, you know, I think as Mike was saying, if he takes over Darius Geis's ADP, I think that's about fair. I mean, he'd be going after Tyler Boyd at that price, which is definitely reasonable. But even then, guys like Will Fuller in that range or like a Julian Edelman, Edelman's more of a uh, safer play and Will Fuller's more of an upside play. But I feel like those are much, much safer picks than an Antonio Gibson who could realistically be like a CJ Pro size zero for you week in, week out, just because it might take time for him to transition from almost like a part-time player in college to being a full-time guy in the NFL. We also have no fucking idea what his role is. Like we owe everything about Gibbs right now is completely project. What if he just starts the year as like the running back three on the depth chart? That's not out of the range of possibilities at all. And you're going to use a six round pick on him. Like we've seen dumber shit happen in the NFL than putting him as the third running back on the depth chart, you know? So it's like six round, absolutely let someone else take him. I think once he starts getting to the seventh or eighth round, maybe you could do it. I, I'm probably going to let someone else draft him in my leagues because there's too much uncertainty around the the situation and the role because we have no idea what he's going to look like this year yeah i mean it's all come back to price right like look when he was going in the 10th 10th round 12th round i'm all about that because at that at that range i have i give zero fucks about the floor of a player i'm only looking for the upside and it's a very very um i guess uh unequal like weighted risk versus reward but when you're creeping into like the fifth or sixth round like those are like literally guys you need to start like week one so i mean at that point you kind of have to be out on that price uh for redraft purposes um and then you know even in dynasty you guys gotta be pretty pretty on the lookout for this stuff because you know i've seen trades go through or like antonio gibson for like henry ruggs antonio gibson for first antonio gibson for multiple firsts like Price is definitely getting up there. And, you know, even as Dude, like no one, no one gave up multiple firsts for Antonio Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Someone did. Um, but like, I just think like, even though we love Antonio Gibson, there are prices we got to be willing to exit at. And if I'm getting like a mid 2021 first, I'm totally happy pocketing that, that, that benefit we got, because look, we told you guys to draft them in the late second round. And now that late second round has turned into a first round pick in the matter of two months. Um, so you, it's totally okay to pocket that profit and just like cash out. And that's something that I'll be looking to do in dynasty. I have Antonio Gibson a lot of places because as you know, we've been touting him a lot. So I'm going to definitely going to be start exploring and even, you know, just trading Antonio Gibson for like a LaVisca Chenault dynasty. I think that's a trade you can get done immediately. You might even get something oh, back easy, with a third yeah. round pick, uh, Antonio Gibson for T Higgins, Antonio Gibson for, for that like tier of like second round wide receivers, that tier, tier three wide receiver group that we used to have. I think that is a, a money money in the bank trade that you guys should all be exploring if you have Antonio Gibson and one that I will definitely be doing. Yeah, I think you got to be excited if you own Gibson in Dynasty just because like any news like this is going to be good news for his, his outlook in his first year, which is important for his outlook going forward. I don't own him anywhere in Dynasty, unfortunately. The only league I do have him in is the Scott Fishbowl, which I was kind of pumped about because he was like my 13th or 14th round pick there. as like a running back dart. And now he shot up the draft board and I need help at running back in that league Badly. Someone from Big Dog is better fucking take home the crown, Scott Fishbowl. It'd be fucking <laughs> sick. That'd be amazing. Won't be me. Nah, it won't be me either. I think that <laughs> stinks. <laughs> it's gonna be animal. Dude, that would be if it was be if best. it was animal or George, I would lose my shit. <laughs> I would absolutely lose my shit. It'd be amazing. Okay. That's uh that's all we got for today's app, right? Yes, yes sir. that's it. Okay, so we will leave you with these parting words. Again, if you want the culmination of all of our work, everything that we have recorded and edited and researched over the last five six months it is available in the draft guide monkeyknifefight.com use the promo code bdge when you throw ten dollars to play with on their website as soon as you play a game you will get access to our draft guides and we're doing two giveaways again go subscribe to the bunk bed breakdowns youtube and podcast leave a rating and review on their podcast and you will be entered into the giveaway and make sure you're following them too on twitter as well if you all enjoyed the video hit the thumbs up subscribe to all the channels all that stuff will be linked and explained in depth in the description down below i'm gonna go fucking pass away because it is sunday evening and i've done way too much yelling today now we got the narrative dude you're not going anywhere <laughs> <Peace>. <laughs>